Good. I'm here. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Deborah Treisman. I'm the fiction editor at The New Yorker, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 2011 New Yorker Festival and to tonight's conversation uh, about the writer's writer with Jeffrey Eugenides, Nicole Krauss, and Jim Lahiri. So I need to ask you before we get started to um, turn off anything that might beep or ring or be otherwise annoying and um, remind you that fo taking photographs is not allowed. And oh, everybody's doing it. That's wonderful. Never seen such a quick reaction. <laughs> um, and uh, I was also asked to tell you that if you plan to tweet during or following this event, you should use the hashtag TNYFest. So uh, do with that whatever you want. Um, the, and the plan is for us to talk among ourselves for an hour or so, and then we will open up to questions from you. So uh, hold those for the end. Um, so to my, my far left is uh, Jeffrey Eugenides, who's the author of three books, the 1993 novel The Virgin Suicides, the 2002 Pulitzer Prize winning novel Middlesex, and now The Marriage Plot, which is coming out in a few days? About a week and a half. And, okay. And uh, was excerpted twice in The New Yorker. Whether he's writing about teenage sisters in a mysterious suicide pact, or the journey of one mutated gene through three generations of Greeks and Greek Americans, or a trio of college graduates' quest for love, sanity, and religious faith, he conveys in elegant, rich, and often funny ways our ongoing search for identity and the meaning of life. Uh, next to him is Nicole Krauss, who is also the author of three books. Her 2002 debut novel, Man Walks Into a Room, the 2005 bestseller, The History of Love, and last year's Great House, which was a finalist for the National Book Award. The forces of forgetting and memory are at war in most of her writing. Secrets haunt families across generations. Mysteries are only partially solved. Resolution is within grasp and then retracted at the last moment. Her novels are, in a way, ghost stories, but these ghosts are real people who haunt their own histories. As one critic put it, Krauss's novels are a high-wire performance, only the wire has been replaced by an exposed nerve, and you hold your breath, and she does not fall. Jhumpa Lahiri's debut story collection, The Interpreter of Maladies, won the Pulitzer Prize in 2000, and was followed in 2003 by her novel, The Namesake, and in 2008 by her story collection, Unaccustomed Earth, which debuted at number one on the New York Times bestseller list. All three books offer carefully calibrated portraits of Indian immigrants in the, in the United States, arriving here for arranged marriages, coping with the alienations of American suburban or city life, and raising American children who struggle to move on from their heritage. The clash of cultures and the clash of generations are observed with a kind of omniscient compassion and a lightness of touch that make her, that make her stories feel both fully imagined and vividly real. Please welcome all three writers. So the, the title of our um, discussion tonight is The Writer's Writer, and um, I think before we even launch on that, we probably should try to come to terms with what this phrase actually means. Um, so I was, I was looking around for a basic definition of the term, and I came across this paragraph in a piece that Cynthia Ozick wrote for the New York Times a few years ago. It went like this. The saddest words of tongue or pen, writer's writer, a synonym for obscurity. Every writer understands exactly what that fearful possessive hints at, a modicum of professional admiration accompanied or subverted by dim public rec recognition and even dimmer sales. Yet the writer's writer is said to write not in hope of fame, but out of quiet passion, and is thereby accorded a purity not granted to the household name. Both André Dubus and Gina, Gina Berrio labored long under this doubtful enconium. Both escaped it. Both came to be celebrated as writers, released at last from the piously diminishing apostrophe. Um, I, someone else I saw defined the writer's writer as uh, someone who lives at or below the poverty line. <laughs> um, so so what, is this, what is this category exactly? And, and I just want to be clear that we're not saying that any of these people seated on the stage today are writer's writers. We're, we're here to talk about other people who are writer's writers. Um, why is this term sometimes a compliment? Why is it sometimes construed as a kind of sly insult? And, and what's wrong with being recognized as great by the people who know exactly what it takes to be great? Um, you know, would we say something disparaging about a baseball player's baseball player? Um, what do you guys think about this? And what is your take on this, this phrase? I, I had the same ambivalent feelings about it as, as, the, as the topic for our discussion. Because I remember being, being young and really wanting to be a writer's writer. That seemed like the best 
best kind of writer to be. And then I was talking to someone and saying that I was going to be in this panel. When, what, what's the panel on? Writer's writer. And they said, oh, you'll be, you'll be perfect for that. <laughs> and suddenly I felt slightly offended. So I realized what, what had happened to me in my life that I had gone from really wanting to be one, still admiring, admiring it and somehow not wanting to be labeled at it. And I think yeah. Cynthia Ozick's piece uh, yeah. sums that up pretty well. Yeah. But I, you know, I think if I had to define the term myself, I would probably say um, a, a writer's writer is a writer who does many things that only writers can admire or mainly my writers that admire. Um, and it, it, you know, I'm going to talk about Dennis Johnson and, and Nabokov, and these are, are, are writers that would be wonderful to be. So I, I don't think it's a, a badge of dishonor in any way. But usually the writer who's a writer's writer is, is working usually at two levels. And, and one level is the kind of jazz master's level where some of the things that are going on might be you know, appreciated more by by fellow practitioners and, and instead of just an um, interested reader. Yeah, I mean, I, it, what would you say about someone who is a doctor's doctor? You know, they're going to be the best at their trade. So it is, it is a kind of funny expression in a way. It is. And, and if, if something that's great about writing can only be appreciated by other writers, is the writing still great? You know, it's, I think it's also the question of whether we're talking about the writer's writer as a writer who is largely unread or not well read, not read enough, so obscurity, or whether we're talking about somebody who has something which for whatever reason is instructive to other writers or contagious somehow or somehow opens their vision of what's possible in the work. And those seem to me two different things, although often they come yeah. together. Yeah. Um, I, th I think another category worth adding to your categories is the writer who arrives to us in translation, so who is well known in their own country, celebrated in their own country, but who is obscure here. So yeah. I know when you were asking for a list of writers, I thought of, you know, most of the writers that I love are writers, writers here, but perhaps not in their own country. Thomas Bernhardt, for example, mm -hmm. the Austrian writer, yeah. or Bruno Schultz, who I'll talk about tonight, who in Poland certainly is a hugely celebrated figure, literary mm -hmm. figure, but very obscure here. Yeah, um, I, I also I feel I should warn you that there's been some inflation in the term and um, I, I found out that John Ashbery called Elizabeth Bishop a writer's writer's writer. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I still can't actually figure out what that could mean, but um, <laughs> you know, um, so it, uh, when we were emailing about this earlier, Jeff, you brought up um, you know, what for you would be defining for this category, and you, you mentioned Nabokov's term, um, aesthetic bliss, which he mentioned in the afterword to Lolita um, in the sentence, for me a work of fiction exists only insofar as it affords me what I shall bluntly call aesthetic bliss, that is a sense of being somehow somewhere connected with other states of being where art, curiosity, tenderness, kindness, ecstasy is the norm. So is that, is that for you what would define who you think of in this way? And, and how do you interpret that That just that sounds phrase. like good, good writing to me. I've always yeah. loved, loved that quote because that's exactly yeah. what I, I look for in a book. It sounds a little rarefied, um, aesthetic bliss, but I know what he means. And I, I look for <laughs> it when, in books when I'm reading. It's what I, it's what I read for, really. Yeah. Hmm. Um, I think the sports metaphor, I mean, I'm preoccupied by the fact that the Tigers are playing the, the Yankees right now. So. Um, <laughs> A baseball a player is a baseball player. I don't know. But maybe in golf, certain people have a beautiful swing. And you'll hear the commentators talk about the swing. Um, and, and yet the guy doesn't, doesn't win the tournament um, often. So it, it perhaps is, is a difference between perfection of, of doing something and the, the other side is, is somehow, I don't know, getting some kind of major achievement done that is more clearly recognized and you know, on, the, on the stat sheet, and not just by the by the observer's connoisseurship, maybe. Yeah. Well, so I um, I was very interested because I asked you before we came here to um, each send me a, a few names of people that you thought you thought of in this way, and mm -hmm. just to come back to what Nicole was saying that we that there there are these two ways of seeing this, whether whether the, you're talking about writers who have for whatever reason had a huge influence on other writers, 
or whether you're talking about writers who have simply been underappreciated by the, the general public. And, and I think you were both, in a way, including people that, uh, that fell into both categories. But what was interesting to me was that between the three of you, there wasn't a single name that overlapped. Um, you all mentioned completely different people. And, uh, and so for me, it, it renders the whole thing um, not meaningless, but it, this, is, this is a huge <laughs> category. Basically, you're yeah. saying who you love, yeah. who you love to read. And, um, and I also thought, Jeff, in your, in your new novel, you described someone's personal library as a kind of personality test. So I, I thought maybe these lists were, in some sense, a personality test for you guys. But um, maybe we could start with, with your list of names, which included John Hawkes and Gilbert Sorrentino and Saul Bellow and Nabokov and Dennis Johnson, Nicholson Baker and Colm Toybean, among others. Mm -hmm. So what is defining for you about these people? What do they have in common? Um, most of those writers, obviously, are, are stylists. Um, and you might read them just for the, the pleasure of their sentences. Um, it's funny that I included someone like Bella, who you know won more National Book Awards and Pulitzers than anybody else. So he's, you know, I think you can be a writer's writer and be, a, you know, the toast of the town. I don't think it, it has to be the opposite of that. Um, but th those writers, for two, I guess they fall into two categories. There's the stylist like like Bella and the Bakov. But then there's the writers' writers who um, maybe had a, a, a smaller audience because of the ferocity of their theoretical work. Like Sorrentino is a postmodern writer who, on, on purpose, wants to frustrate narrative pleasure and wants to, um, you know, always kind of thwart the, the expectation that is in most most normal fiction, most realistic fiction. So that's why he he's a writer's writer to to read him and to. To enjoy him, you have to know a fair body of, of literature and you know the, the nouveau roman that he's that he's actually playing off of. Right. Um, the other ones, I think, are, are writers' writers just because of the luxuriance of their of their writing, the idiosyncrasy of their of their prose style, and the originality of it. So that's why I put them in. Mm -hmm. And you were going to read to us a, a short excerpt from a Dennis Johnson story. I, go um, ahead and that. I was, I was. I also brought a Nabokov. Um, it depends. It depends how long I'm supposed to um, <laughs> talk about why it's a writer's writer, because this this one is more what I'm talking about. I'll just read this for now because okay. I just um, I just was reading Panin. For some reason, I've never. That's the one of the only Nabokov books I haven't read, and I was I was reading it and. Um, I came across a sentence that isn't especially an important sentence, and it isn't really um, even Nabokov at his best. He's sort of idling his engine, but there's so many things going on um, in it that when I, when I, when I read it and I, I knew we were coming to talk about this, it, it leapt out at me as, as what I always thought of as a writer's writer, someone really working every angle of, of, uh, of possibilities in every sentence. This is just a description of this Russian professor as he goes out of his office and across the campus. Um, at, at, at noon, as usual, Panin washed his hands and head. He picked up in Office R his overcoat, muffler, book, and briefcase. Dr. Faltenfels was writing and smiling. His sandwich was half unwrapped. His dog was dead. Panin walked down the gloomy stairs and through the Museum of Sculpture. Humanities Hall, where, however, ornithology and anthropology also lurked, was connected with another brick building, Freeze Hall, which housed the dining room and the faculty club by means of a rather rococo openwork gallery. It went up a slope, then turned sharply and wandered down toward a routine smell of potato chips and the sadness of balanced meals. In summer, its trellis was alive with quivering flowers, but now, through its nakedness, an icy wind blew, and someone had placed a found red mitten upon the spout of the dead fountain that stood where one branch of the gallery led to the president's house. You know, just, just those phrases, the routine smell of potato chips. You know, it's true that I work at a university now, and I'm often, um, I often encounter the routine smell of potato chips. Um, but... That kind of phrase. When I when I first started reading and fell in love with with literature, it was that kind of 
that kind of writing and, and, and the, the attention to all the details. I mean, it's, he's just moving this guy from, from his office to the next scene. And he takes that amount of care um, so that that's actually as interesting as the, as the dramatic scene that, that follows it. Do you want to talk about Dennis Johnson? I can too, talk or? about Dennis Johnson okay. too. Um, <laughs> Dennis Johnson, that, something else that just occurred to me is in a way to be the, a writer's writer is the best thing in the world because we all know as writers the writers that the other writers really ad admire. And there's not that many of them. And there's a few of them that you will almost never get anyone to disagree with you about. Um, and that's why I picked Dennis Johnson, because I feel like when you bring up Dennis Johnson, almost everyone, regardless of their taste, ad admires what he does. It's also, there's also a little bit of personality that goes into being a writer's writer. Like Dennis Johnson isn't here and probably would never accept to come. Has he ever been to the festival? Yes. I mean, he, he doesn't like to go out and do things. Um, his, most recent, his most recent author photo is um, a great photo wearing some aviator shade, so he has a kind of reclusiveness. Yeah. He does come out now and then. He came out in Germany a few years ago, and I had the um, daunting task of interviewing him. And he doesn't like to talk about his, his personal life or, or anything. And if you give him the wrong question, he's very sweet in general, but if you give him the wrong question, you see a moment where maybe he's going to get, get angry. And as an interviewer, it, it really is, is frightening. <laughs> and so I realized that all you had to do with him was just ask a couple of words about a story, and then he would tell great stories. But you never, you never wanted to plumb him too, too, too much. So there's part of his mystique. I mean, he lives in a place um, in Idaho part of the year, and his studio is across from a beaver, beaver creek. And the beavers began to dam up the, the, the creek, and it began to flood his studio. And so finally, he, he, he learned how to shoot guns, and he shot all of the beaver. So that's, that's a writer's writer right there. <laughs> um, this is a, a story called Car Crash While Hitchhiking. Um, and just before I begin, so, so why I picked it, I, I picked it because it's a very short story. It's only about 1,000 words. And he does everything that you shouldn't do in a short story. To write a good short story, you have to learn how to cut out everything unnecessary, all the exposition and explanation. And Dennis Johnson does this, but he also tells you exactly what's going to happen in the story at the beginning. You know, and it would seem as though he's going to thwart any kind of anticipation, but it doesn't really work that way. Um, a salesman who shared his liquor and steered while sleeping. A Cherokee filled with bourbon. A VW no more than a bubble of hashish fumes, captained by a college student and a family from Marshalltown who head-owned and killed forever a man driving west out of Bethany, Missouri. I rose up sopping wet from, the sleeping, from sleeping under the pouring rain and something less than conscious, thanks to the first of, three, of the three people I've already named, the salesman and the Indian and the student, all of whom had given me drugs. At the head of the entrance ramp, I waited without hope of a ride. What was the point, even, of rolling up my sleeping bag when I was too wet to be led into anybody's car? I draped it around me like a cape. The downpour raked the asphalt and gurgled in the ruts. My thoughts zoomed pitifully. The traveling salesman had fed me pills that made the linings of my veins feel scraped out. My jaw ached. I knew every raindrop by its name. I sensed everything before it happened. I knew a certain Oldsmobile would stop for me even before it slowed, and by the sweet voices of the family inside it, I knew we'd have an accident in the storm. I didn't care. They said they'd take me all the way. Um, you know, the, the opening of this, what, what I like about it so much is that you're given these small clues that hint at what is, what is odd or what is wrong with this person. If, you know, the first sign is when he says, um, the car head on and killed forever a man driving west. And you, you think about it for a moment. You think, what do you, what do you mean killed, killed for, forever? Isn't killed, could you be killed temporarily? Uh, you know. <laughs> and little by little, as it, as it proceeds, he, has, he makes these sort of 
utterances. I knew every raindrop by its name. As the, and and as, as the story goes on, you realize um, the extent of his, of his drug use and how everything in the story um, is, is determined by, by his altered consciousness. But instead of telling you this and having lots of explanation, he just puts you right in the, in the midst of this e experience. Um, so that you, you don't have to understand it, you just experience it right away. And when I, I mentioned to Nicole in the, in the back room that I was reading this story, you, she said, is that the one with the line? <laughs> so I think, I think that shows um, what, a, what a writer's writer is, is if you mention a, a story, someone will quote a line from it. And I'll, I'll read that line. Later on, um, after the crash, the, this character who's, um, whose name is not given in the story but is, is known, I think my, my daughter is in the other room and can't hear me. His name is Fuckhead. Um, <laughs> in the book. And he finally ends up in the, in the hospital and the man driving the car has died and his wife is going in to see him. And there's, there comes this paragraph. Down the hall came the wife. She was glorious, burning. She didn't know yet that her husband was dead. We knew. That's what gave her such power over us. The doctor took her into a room with a desk at the end of the hall and from under the closed door, a slab of brilliance radiated as if by some stupendous process, diamonds were being incinerated in there. What a pair of lungs. She shrieked as I imagined an eagle would shriek. It felt wonderful to be alive to hear it. I've gone looking for that feeling everywhere. That was the line that, that Nicole remember. I've gone looking for that feeling everywhere. Um, the story is amazing because you can't understand where you're, where you're to place it in terms of morality. Um, that he loves this moment so much where a woman screams over, over her, her dead husband makes sense in the, in, in the rationale of the story, but it doesn't make sense in our regular life. And within three pages, somehow you're, you're, you're made, if you read the whole story, to, to share this guy's... Um, mind and, 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 and where he is in his life at that moment. Um, and it's that kind of, I don't know, that kind of extreme goal that, 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 that Dennis Johnson is after here that makes it to me a, a writer's writer's story. Because you see what he's doing. You see that he's doing, making all these choices that no one would make um, normally. And the, 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 the high wire act of, 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 of his story. Um, it's really an, ama an amazing thing, and I could go on, but I, I won't. Mm -hmm. I just want to, you, you reminded me that the last time I edited a piece by, by Dennis Johnson, every time I called to talk to him about the edits, his mm -hmm. wife would answer the phone and say, oh, he's out fishing. Um, he was always out fishing. Yeah. And, and maybe that's a sign of a writer's writer, if not a fisherman's fisherman. Um, also, I, I as you guys know, I edit a monthly podcast where I ask a writer to choose another writer's story to read aloud and talk mm -hmm. about. And, and Dennis Johnson is the person who's been most requested. Really? Yeah. Um, followed uh, closely by <laughs> Nabokov um, and also yeah. Donald Barthelme, um, which is who I would put in this category. Mm -hmm. So we'll come back to all these things, I hope. But Jumpa, um, let's talk about your list of writers, which included James Salter, Mavis Gallant, Fernando Pessoa, and... Uh, like Cynthia Ozick, Andre Dubus, and Gina Berrio. And what was it about these writers that made you put them together? What was their defining quality, if, if there is one? Um, well, that not many people, not many people know them. Um, not many people have read them, um, sort of under the radar in many respects. Um, I think that I mean, there are a couple of things I wanted to sort of just begin with. I mean, one, I think that when we talk about this term, I think, I mean, I'd like to hear what other people have to say. I think it's a particularly American way of looking at writers and writing. I, my sense in other parts of the world is that they wouldn't really understand what this all meant. I think in America there's a particular focus on um, a certain type of literary success and, uh, you know, uh, recognition mm -hmm. that doesn't drive 
uh, other writers in other parts of the world and that writers are understood and respected in, in, uh, on a different scale um, than, than here. Uh, and I do think that's, I think it's something worth addressing because mm -hmm. I think that most of these writers' writers are American. I mean, I mentioned Pessoa, I would mention, say, Margaret Yourcenar in America. I would mention other writers in translation who don't penetrate, you know, the, the readership in this country in the same way. But I, I, I do think there's a, a different mentality toward what it means to be successful in America in any level, in any discipline, career, what have you. But I think in terms of writing also. Mm -hmm. So I think there is a sort of cultural component to this strange term that we're talking about tonight. Um, I also think that it's very particular to short story writers uh, because I, I do think that um, certainly in the United States and in other parts of the world too, the short story form remains sort of the underdog of literature, of prose fiction, always lesser to the novel and so therefore writers who specialize in the short form like Mavis um, and some of these other writers like Andre Debus they get the short trip because of that, because less people are willing to read short stories, buy short stories, what have you. Um, less publishers are willing to publish them, less agents are willing to sell them, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it's just nobody needs to belabor that point. But I do think there's a sort of, you know, I mean, if you look at the sort of, the other day I went on the, uh, the site for the Ray Short Story Award and they have all the list of all the people who have received it. And, you know, I would, I would say that 75% of them could be part of this panel conversation, you know, um, which is sad and, and, um, and infuriating to me personally. Um, so there's that. Um, and, um, but I, I, you know, I feel like a writer's writer to me is, you know, and I would like to hear what Jeff and Nicole think about this, but I feel like, you know, every writer wants to write as well as he or she can, you know, and I, and I think that we all start out in a certain place. And we all, nobody knows what's going to happen, but we all begin somewhere. And at some point, something brings us to our desks and we start writing something. And it turns into something that is our first book. And we write in complete ignorance and in darkness and we have no idea, will this book ever even see the light of day? Will anyone ever read this apart from me and maybe my best friend or my mother or something, you know? And then after that point, whatever happens, happens. And for some people, it is, it is success and it is publication and it is readership and it is another book and another one after that and that sort of thing. And then for other writers, I mean, there are millions of ways that story plays out. But everybody writes a first book in a, with a certain purity of vision a certain innocence and a certain intensity and a certain integrity that I think is really, I think a writer's writer maintains that integrity mm -hmm. no matter what, even if he or she is on his fourth or fifth or tenth book. There's something about adhering to that purity of vision and not caring about whether this book will be popular or successful or if someone's going to you know, give it a good review or a bad review or people are going to buy it or not buy it. And, and I think that distinguishes the work of, uh, certainly the writers that I think of in that category. And, you know, partly it's a stubbornness, perhaps. Um, you know, there, there's a certain sort of flying in the face of reality and bill paying and other things. Um, but I, st I still believe that, the, that those writers maintain that, that insistence upon um, their craft. And, um, and are not, their, their approach to their work remains intact and is not swayed by, oh, well, now I have all these people reading my books, or, well, now I've got this publisher, and I've got this agent, and I've got this readership, and now what do I do, you know? Um, and I do think for certain writers, that experience begins to shift and, and shape their attitude toward their work. Um, if you look at a lot of sort of the earlier works of, of a lot of writers, they're much more idiosyncratic because they're written in that, that, that bubble, you know, that, that place of sort of isolation and purity. And then they actually become successful and the books necessarily take on a different character. Yeah. Um, whereas I think with writers, writers, the ones I, I really admire, there's that consistency 
of really just, you know, the, the, the excellence, the excellence of the work, and nothing else is, is really coming into play. Well, it may be also why you, why you link this so much to short story writers is that there's far fewer expectations of success if you're going yes, to stubborn. practically stick like to the being a story. poet, right? <laughs> so, you know, um, yeah. So, I mean, I, I do think that that is definitely the case with, with most short story writers. I mean, yeah. yeah. With, a, with a few people who, who pretty much exclusively stick to stories like Alice Munro or Mavis Gallant or, or, uh, or Dubus. Yeah. And they're just the tip of the eye. I mean, there's yeah, so many yeah. people writing short stories, you know, and at least, the, you know, they're a little bit known. And then there's, you know, just layers of writers who are, you know, they, they stick to that form and they, they're, they don't get out there. They don't penetrate the readership in a certain way and they remain, mm -hmm. you know, relatively right. obscure right. as a result. Well, you were going to read us a uh, uh, Gina Berrio piece. Yeah, so. with pleasure. Um, so this is um, a collection called The Infinite Passion of Expectation. Um, the story is The Houses of the City. And I'll just read the first three paragraphs of this story. On some days, he longed to be with his mother before the hour of her return to their rooms. And in the afternoon, he would seek her out at whatever house she was cleaning that day, even though the place was halfway across the city, up in the heights, where the big houses stood apart like rich merchants' wives watching their husbands' ships entering the bay below. In his small body was the quality of the pointer dog. He walked, slightly stooped, pushing forward, his feet going down in a plodding way. It was late in his tenth year when he began this practice. He would be in the midst of a scuffle after school along a sidewalk somewhere, and suddenly he would think of her and at that moment offer nothing further to the struggle. This silent urgency was more effective in breaking his opponent's grip than was his fierce animal strength. Always in the morning, she told him where she would be that day so that if anything happened to him at school, his teacher could call her right away. He felt that it was impossible for anything to harm him, but anything could harm her. She was alarmed the first time she opened a door to him. He was not sick, he told her, but he had no other reason to give. Of his fear of, di of her dying, he could not tell, because to give words to this fear was like pronouncing sentence upon her. If he kept it to himself, the fear might prove groundless. After the first time they said nothing on his arrival, he made no demands upon her and sat in the chair she pointed to, his hands folded obviously away from the lure of knickknacks and magazines. He listened to the sounds of her cleaning in other rooms and was not restless. So, you know, I mean, I was reading, I was trying to figure out, you know, there were so many passages that I wanted to read from, from Gina Berrio's work, and I was reading a few with, with my friend riding in the car, and, and what we, we concluded was, I mean, every sentence, every sentence makes you, makes you stop, makes me stop, oops, sorry, <laughs> makes me stop and think, oh my God, that's an amazing sentence. That is yeah. saying so much, that is doing so much, that there is nothing in there that's sort of just supportive tissue, you know? I mean, it's all vital, um, and her, you know, this is just, I mean, this is the beginning of a story and it's, you're sort of in the middle of the story, of course, but it is a beginning of the story and it's so immediate and it's so intense and the child point of view, which is so nuanced and mature and um, at the same time believable, you know, it's just an example of the type of writing I think you don't typically see, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, 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 um, I mean, another thing I'll say about the, this whole writer's writer's business, you know, I mean, I think part of it is also, I mean, when I was start, first starting to write, getting interested in writing, you know, I was a student. I didn't have very much money. I couldn't really afford to go to bookstores and buy new books. So I would troll used bookstores, which are now few and far between a dying breed. But, you know, back in the 80s anyway, there were tons of them in New York where I went to college. And that's what I would do in my spare time. I would just wander around the city going to different used bookstores with, you know, $10 or something and get a pile of books. And I would get all these amazing out-of-print books. 
which is, you know, the ultimate fate of the writer's writers that their yeah. books are not in circulation, they're not in print. But I found them, you know, because I was, I was in these stores all the time and I was just prowling around and looking at the shelves and, you know, one would lead me to the other, you know. So, I mean, I mean, if you look at the back of this book, she's got blurbs from Wright Morris, Richard Yates, Andre Dubuse, you know, I mean, so there, there's a whole network of writers and, and who are supporting these other writers and, you know, trying to get these writers to be more widely read, et cetera. But, but that's another part of it, too, I think. I mean, the whole climate, I mean, has changed in terms of how we get books and where we find books. And, um, I mean, I, I feel that, you know, I was formed and informed as a writer at a time when I was still able to sort of hunt and peck and use bookstores and find things, you know, that were, that had been out of print for a decade, and I would read them, and I would, I would you know, I was hungry for them. And now it's, it's, it's not the same world that we have anymore, right. and you can't. You know, you have to know. You have to know the name to try to find the book. You know, one of her books on Amazon or Ex Libris or something. Yeah. yeah. All my books smell. I can I can smell them, <laughs> and remember the used store in in San Francisco where I, where I bought them. You know, what's cor Corner of Hate, and and Scott. You know, it has a certain aroma. The cigar <laughs> the cigar smoking owner. Books are still imbued with that smell. That that, that is the greatest. Um, aid to the young writers to use bookstores. So it, is a, it is really a problem, though, their yeah. disappearance. Yeah. Well, I want to come back to the notion of starting out as a writer, too. But let's first um, talk about Nicole's, Nicole's list, which um, was definitely the most international list, um, you know, as, aside from what you said about it being a, an American notion. Um, Nicole, you included Bruno Schultz and Thomas Bernhard and W.G. Sebald, Joel Hoffman, Zbigny of Herbert, Joseph Brodsky, Yehuda Amichai, among others. So what for you was, was your guiding force in that, making that list? Right. Well, some of those writers are, as I said, so celebrated in their own countries, and some of them not at all, um, even though they are some of the greatest writers of their language. I suppose, for me, the writer's writer is somebody who liberates the ordinary run-of-the-mill writer from having to pay attention to the kinds of things that maybe we grew up thinking we have to pay attention to or that are necessary, rather the rules of storytelling, whether they have to do with development of character or a plot line that's continuous and linear and reaches a climax and a resolution, all those things that in the broad scope of novels the reader comes to expect. Maybe the, re the writer's writer um, offers a kind of freedom in a way from the reader's expectations. Maybe that's another way of talking about this purity that Jumpo mm -hmm. was alluding to. Um, but for me, all of those writers um, gave me a sense of the shock of sort of everything being possible again having come to certain terms of what a novel should be, or a story should be, or a poem, and then realizing, you no, know, in fact, it could be something completely other. And some of those are very specific things. I mean, a writer like Thomas Bernhard is, is trained musically. His work is so much about mu music, about rhythm, really. And he can be infuriating to the reader. He loved to infuriate readers, which is also a very un-American thing. And sometimes I think part of why I love him is because sort of I come of age as a writer in a time when likability is so, seems so important. Um, um, but a writer like Bernhard staked his life on disturbing and aggravating and provoking. But partly that was content of what he said, but also simply in the shape of the sentences, which can be incredibly repetitive but are incredibly beautiful. And these strange significances seem to arise out of this endless repetition of ideas, each one slightly shifted. Um, and then a writer like Yoram Kanyuk, who I discovered not, I mean, really not very long ago, a couple of years ago, wandered into a bookstore, not a used one, but it seems even bookstores are going by the wayside. So, um, but th there was a time when you, you could go in and browse. And I think this is a really important point because, of course, you can't browse on Amazon, or rather, the recommendations that come back to you there are the recommendations of more you-ness, the you you've always been, you know. <laughs> and walking into a bookstore offers you this opportunity of 
surprise and serendipity, the thing that you never would have possibly discovered otherwise. Um, two very different things, one which solidifies us and one which has the possibility of changing us. So I walked into a bookstore and there was this book by this writer, Yoram Kamyot, and the title was The Last Jew, so I couldn't really pass that title up. <laughs> and, um, and then there was this quote from Susan Sontag on the cover about, you know, of all the writers in translation I've discovered, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, Hanka, and Yoram Kanyak are the greatest. And I thought, who is this guy? I've never heard of him. And, and I read a lot of Israeli literature, and I found it strange that I hadn't heard of him. And that book, I mean, it was written th more than 30 years ago, was really despised when it was published in Israel. I mean, it's almost completely unread here, um, although it was republished recently. Um, but it's a book that still reads now as if it were ahead of its time, as if we're still not prepared for it. And that has a lot to do with its, its form. And it's made up of all these strange different forms, recorded interviews, um, all, all kinds of characters and perspectives which kind of mash together. Um, and it's, it's just a sort of masterwork that's, again, gave me that feeling of, wow, I had no idea this was even possible in a novel. Um, so I, I mean, the, the writer that I thought of talking about, because again, I had this sort of schizophrenic confusion about, is a writer's writer somebody who um, has influenced lots of writers or who should be read more? Um, and writers know that more than other readers. I don't know. Right. Um, but I thought of, of talking about Bruno Schultz. Um, because he uh, is so unusual in having really a, a small um, but serious cabal of writers who have tried to more or less resurrect him or rescue him in their work, whether um, by sort of almost bringing the sense of his world or his characters back to life or literally bringing him and his lost work back to life. So just very briefly, um, in case any of you haven't heard of him, his story is sort of critical in all of this, um, which is that basically he was Jewish. He, he uh, grew up in a small uh, Polish town in, in uh, I think, south, southeastern Poland. Um, and during the, the Holocaust, he, well, he was a, a painter and a teacher. Um, a very sort of strange, shy man had already had a book or two published um, and was in the process of writing what, what everyone thinks was his masterpiece, which was called The Messiah. And uh, he was sort of taken under the wing of this Nazi. The, the Nazis were sort of living in the town at this point, and he was sort of that Nazi's Jew, and he, he was hired to paint murals in the... Uh, this Nazi's daughter's room. Um, the story, this, the famous story goes, and David Grossman has written about this in The New Yorker. Some of you may have read it. And it's, now we don't know whether it's true or not. But anyway, one day, sort of, this Nazi shoots another Jew and uh, to sort of take revenge, um, his somebody comes, another Nazi comes and shoots Bruno Schultz, and, and you know, I, you killed my Jew, I killed your Jew. And, this is a story. Anyway, this, these papers of his, uh, the Messiah, and all kinds of other things, stories and so forth that he had, um, were given a little bit before then to somebody, and nobody ever found them. And they, uh, none of them have ever turned up. And there's all kinds of, I don't know, um, ideas about them lying somewhere in some moldering KGB file. Um, but um, I doubt they ever will turn up. So there's the sort of writer like. Um, Danilo Kish, the, um, well, I guess, Serbo-Croatian writer um, who wrote uh, a most beautiful book, Garden Ashes, which is really um, so influenced by Schultz in that sort of line of um, world and characters. Bruno Schultz, this book which I have here is Treat of Crocodiles. Um, I mean, it's really this kind of strange, private, personal creation of a world where um, everything is about sort of exposing the deep mythological meaning of things 
below the surface, the sort of metaphysical core of things. Um, but all through, though, the stories of this family, very autobiographical, it's this child and this father, and the father goes sort of crazier and crazier and gives these amazing, strange soliloquies. Um, and sort of as he becomes more and more the essence of himself and the strange underworld sort of almost ceases to exist. And so Daniela Kish has this novel which in many ways mirrors that. And then, or like Alexander Heyman, for example, also I think is really influenced in certain ways by Schultz because you have um, this sense of um, the inanimate having life. I mean, I just think of like Heyman has these great um, things that could have come right out of Schultz, like um, the paper lay in the fax machine, like a tongue, something like that. I mean, that's like it's so Schultzian, if that's a word. Um, and then there's this whole other category of writer, like um, David Grossman, Philip Roth, uh, Cynthia Ozick, and um, and me. Uh, <laughs> I shouldn't really fit in that category, but um, but did only because Bruno Schultz, does only because Bruno Schultz um, became sort of this critical hinge on which one of my books, The History of Love, really hangs in a way. And um, all of those other writers really, um, there are characters who either are Bruno Schultz or um, are almost Bruno Schultz sort of in their work. And I think in that category of writer, it's not just this strange world of the imagination, which is um, so much more powerful than reality could ever be, um, so much more profound. But, um, but also this idea of this terrible loss, I mean, this, un, this inconsolable sense of this great work and how many other great works, of course, being lost by this writer who feels to so many people like a kind of father figure. What, what did that book, The Messiah, really contain, and this inability of being able to ever know that, um, so this desire to somehow rescue him, rescue that work from oblivion. Um, so I guess I'll read a little bit of him. Mm -hmm. Take a little bit of water. Um, he's sort of, I'm not, not great to read aloud, I warn you, but mm. because he's the kind of writer I think like both you guys, just your choices, um, where every sentence is worth stopping to reread. Um, that may be another definition of the writer's writer. You just never get anywhere because you keep reading the same sentence over and over. <laughs> um, so this is just a strange passage where this father, who you know, um, sort of is everywhere in the Street of Crocodiles, um, and is constantly sort of diminishing and disappearing, disintegrating, and then somehow time changes and he's back again, giving his strange soliloquies and his strange, doing his strange metaphysical experiments. Um, and this is one of those experiments which he um, does on, on the uncle. Having shut himself in his study, father began the gradual penetration into uncle Edward's complicated essence by a tiring psychoanalysis that lasted for many days and nights. The table of the study began to fill with the isolated complexes of Edward's ego. At first, uncle, although much reduced, turned up for meals and tried to take part in our conversations. He also went once more for a ride on his bicycle, but soon gave it up as he felt rather incomplete. A kind of shame took hold of him, characteristic for the stage at which he found himself. He began to shun people. At the same time, father was getting ever nearer to his objective. He had reduced uncle to the indispensable minimum by removing from him one by one all of the inessentials. He placed him high in a wall recess in the staircase, arranging his elements in accordance with the principle of Leclanche's reaction. The wall in that place was moldy and white mildew showed on it. Without scruples, father took advantage of the entire stock of uncle's enthusiasm. He spread his flex along the length of the entrance hall and the left wing of the house. Armed with a pair of steps, he drove small nails into the wall of the dark passage along the whole path of Uncle's present existence. Those smoky yellow afternoons were almost completely dark. Father used a lighted candle which he illuminated the mildewy wall at close quarters, inch by inch. 
I've heard it said that at the last moment, Uncle Edward, until then heroically composed, showed a certain impatience. They say that there was even a violent, although belated, explo explosion that very nearly ruined the almost completed work. But the installation was ready, and Uncle Edward, who all his life had been a model husband, father, and businessman, eventually submitted with dignity to his final role. Uncle functioned excellently. There was no instance of his refusal to obey. Having discarded his complicated personality, in which at one time he had lost himself, he found at last the purity of a uniform and straightforward guiding principle to which he was subjected from now on. At the cost of his complexity, which he could manage only with difficulty, he had now achieved a simple, problem-free immortality. Was he happy? And I mean, I, you know, I guess there is this tension, I think, particularly for all American writers raised up in American literature of you know, reality and how true to reality one ought to be or can be or, or um, how free of it you can get. And this is obviously the opposite extreme. And um, there's, there, there's actually, it's funny to think of Roth writing about um, Schultz because well, there's that famous essay that Roth wrote, I guess, in 1960, 1961, um, called Writing American Fiction, in which he talks about how American reality has become so um, sort of unbelievable, so impossible, that it outdoes the writer's imagination um, and sort of talents. And, and Schultz is sort of the opposite, um, had really very little interest in reality. Reality is just sort of a faint idea um, and was sort of only interested in these sort of enormous journeys of these sort of the strangest possible imagination that I've ever encountered in literature. We've all talked about, um, about these writers as people who, in a way, break rules. And, um, you know, whether it's Dennis Johnson throwing you into a, a very unreliable perspective where you can't understand what, what's driving the, the, the viewpoint for a while, or, mm -hmm. or what you just talked about, Nicole, or, or, you know, starting in the middle of a story in a very intense position. Um, and I wanted to come back to that idea that Jumpa raised about writing your first book and, and writing it in this kind of bubble of purity. And what happens at that point? Who, who are you turning to for guidance and for, you know, to learn how to write? Are you turning to these people who are breaking the rules? Is that freeing you up? I mean, if you can think back to that, that stage of your own purity, were these the people who, who in a sense, you know, you were apprenticed to? Partly, not yeah. entirely. I mean, yeah. at that point, I was guided only by writers yeah. and nothing else, no one else. Um, I mean, myself, a sense of what I wanted to achieve. Um, but mainly, you know, I mean, I think a writer is a, a reader who can't control himself, you know, um, and so therefore writes. And so I felt that when I began writing, that was, that was what I felt I was doing. I was, I was reading in the most extreme way I could. Um, but I mean, I was reading also, I mean, one's reading shifts along with one's self and one go, goes back to things or whatever. I mean, I'm trying to think of what, who I was reading when I was putting together my first book of stories. I mean, I didn't even know I was writing a book. so I, I don't know. Um, well, I was living downstairs from you, and you were writing yeah, it up the there. <laughs> oh, I wasn't sorry. Um, <laughs> Who was she reading, Jess? <laughs> I she was. I she was working a lot. She was cooking and working. I don't know what you you were reading. That wasn't your first book. No. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> no, that's not true. I was finishing that book up, I guess. But um, <laughs> but I felt like I'd written most of it when I got there. I was sort of on the way out. Um, no, but when I, was, when I was really, I mean, the beginning of, I mean, I, I wrote most of that book in, when I was in Boston, so that's why I'm not, okay. when I got up to Provincetown, where Jeff and I both were together, um, I was sort of moving on to the next book. Anyway, um, you know, I was reading, I was reading a lot of short stories. I was writing short stories. I was trying to teach myself how to write a short story, which I did not know how to do until I tried. So I was reading, you know, I read a lot of um, Trevor. I read a lot of Chekhov. I read a lot of, I read... 
Garcia Marquez's short stories. I read Flannery O'Connor. I read, you know, I read a lot of short stories um, when I was, was actually trying to put together my first short stories because I didn't know how to do it and I wanted to know, you know, what's, where's the instruction manual? Of course, there isn't one other than other re writers. Um, but, you know, I mean, I can point to stories in my first book thinking, okay, that's the one I tried to sort of do what Flannery O'Connor was doing, or that's the one I was trying to do what Mark has to do, you know, I mean, whatever, whether or not I succeeded is beside the point, but I remember, you know, studying those stories so intensively, certain stories. Um, by the time I was living um, above Jeff and Karen, you know, I mean, that, that year I was reading a lot of Mavis, um, Mavis Gallant, and Andre Debus, and, um, Tolstoy, and you know, just, it, you know, I mean, I'm just thinking, I mean, it's not necessarily that I sought out obscure writers, but certainly, you know, I mean, I think particularly because I have worked in the short form now for two books, I do look at, you know, I, I look at other short story writers just, you know, to, to see what they're doing, and, and, I, and I know that I was looking at different kinds of short stories in my second collection than from the first. I was looking at more complicated short stories. I was reading more Mavis, Alice Munro, um, you know, the longer Andre Debus stories, um, that sort of thing, um, to to help me. When they um, when they killed Osama bin Laden, the one of the Black Hawk helicopters was was left behind, um, and I heard a story in the news today that. They think that the Pakistanis have given that helicopter to the Chinese. Um, you know, the Americans blew it up, trying to trying to leave no evidence of the helicopter, but they didn't quite blow it up, blow it up well enough. And um, the Pakistanis are giving the helicopter to the Chinese. This, all, this is going to connect. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> so, the, and the Chinese have taken the, the, the helicopter back, and they're figuring out how this, how does this thing work. And, and all of the different devices that, that managed to cloak its advance into the country. That's, that's exactly how I lear learned to write. I would have these amazing Black Hawk, Black Hawk helicopters that I would reverse engineer. I would look at the thing as long as I could in a state of complete ignorance, trying to figure out how did this thing fly. Um, and that, what, what Jumpa said, completely, and I'm in complete agreement with that, that experience. You just fumble your way along at, at, a, at an early time. Um, and that, that, that stage when you're writing your first book is not one I have to re recall because I think it's the one you always write a book in. You, you have to cultivate that, that feeling of it's not for anyone else and you don't know how to do it. It's pretty easy to, to, to get to that one. Um, and I remember when I left New York and went to Berlin and lived far away from most people I knew, it was easier for me to feel as though I was writing my first book again and that no one was waiting for it. So sometimes you have to fool yourself into that feeling, but it is the best one to write in. Um, just trying to think, I mean, you, you had mentioned Bello, Jeff, mm -hmm. I think if he's, a, if he's a writer's writer, it may be partly because he has he gets you so excited about language. There is this sort of sense in which you can't read a bellow sentence, let alone a page, without wanting to sort of leap off of it and start verbosely holding forward to yourself. And, he, and even just a, a single word which bellow brings out of obscurity, which you, nobody else you've ever read has used before or uses it in a certain way yeah. that, you can't, that you've never seen. Um, just sort of the way he could just sort of hatch metaphors when he sat on anything. Yeah. Um, and I, I think when I was writing my first novel, I used to go to Bellow for those little sort of like drug kicks mm -hmm. of just pure language, how exciting it is yeah. to have that kind of energy, yeah. um, verbal energy, um, even if I couldn't have it myself, at least someone else did. Um, and that, or just to get a word in my head, mm -hmm. to sort of um, make something out of that. Um, but I think most of the, um, most of what I was reading and thinking about when I was sort of, well, I had been writing poetry and then started to write my first novel. And I think I didn't, 
um, take apart helicopters in the same way. Um, but I do think I thought some about and, and wish I thought more about and have since thought a lot about um, sort of what kind of writer I wanted to be. And that had to do with a kind of the spirit in which one writes. And I think coming out of poetry, there were poets who I had begun to think that I, I was perhaps learning that from. And that stayed with me to a certain degree um, as I became a novelist and realized that, in fact, I felt more, much more comfortable being a novelist. But poets like um, and other Polish writers, beginning of Herbert, or Yehuda Amichai, or Brodsky, who I also knew a little, uh, were sort of instructive to me in the kind of um, spirit, really, um, the kind of ambition um, of what was, what, um, what mattered and what didn't matter. And it's very hard for me to put my finger on exactly those things. I mean, I've spent the decades since still trying to figure out what those are. Yeah. Um, but something about them um, and reading them still now returns me to that, sort of some, um, keeps me true to that in some way. Mm -hmm. I, I'm still laughing at Jumpa's definition of a, a writer as a reader gone amok, um, or who can't control himself. But I, I, I feel as though when you talk about, when all three of you talk about these writers, you're a little bit like the painter in the museum who's going up and studying the brush strokes rather than stepping back and that I think, you know, do you think that writers read differently than non-writers? Can you turn it off? Can you, do you read as, as a writer with a sort of professional eye to what is, what is she doing in this sentence? What is this line doing? And can you sometimes just read for an effect to wash over you? I don't. <laughs> You're shaking your head. No, I don't anymore. I mean, Which one? <laughs> I don't, I mean, I'm always, you know, I've been writing for too long, and I, I feel that, you know, I mean, I only have a certain number of books I'm ever going to write and a certain number of books I'm ever going to read, and, you know, you know, at some point you become aware of that clock ticking, and you realize, you know, you're not going to, you want to read, you want to get the most of, you know, what you can out of what you're reading, and I, I am, I'm much more selective, I suppose, in that regard. Um, you know, I, I don't, sometimes when I'm writing, I, I can't even read. I think this is common among many writers, um, especially sort of when they're very intensely inside of, of a book. I, very hard for me to read, you know, when I was working very hard on my book this summer and, you know, I would work all day and I, at night I would just listen to the radio, I'd listen to some jazz and I would go to sleep. You know, I just, I couldn't even read. And, um, you know, but I do, I mean, I, I do feel like, and it's interesting to, you know, I mean, I, I think there, there's a distinction um, between sort of this term of the writer's writer and sort of influence of writers that we as writers have had, which I feel like what, you know, what we've been talking about lately. But I do think if we go back to the original sort of premise of the, the evening and the, and the term, even if it is sort of a wobbly, odd one, um, I think it is, you know, I think it's worth keeping in the vocabulary simply for purposes of trying to understand, you know, why does one writer become more well-read versus less well-read? I mean, does it really have to do with a matter of quality or expertise? I mean, there's so many factors yeah. that go into why one writer starts, you know, breaking out and becoming part of more of sort of the public dialogue and other writers remain very obscure, but I, but I do think that you know there is a case to be made for writers who are who do remain, you know, I think tragically mm -hmm. misunderstood and misrepresented and unread, and it's, it's I find it tragic, you know. I mean, I find it tragic that, that a writer like Mavis Gallant, who's almost ninety years old and who is truly one of the the most brilliant writers who's ever lived and nobody knows her yeah. you know I mean it's just unbelievable I mean it's so shocking to me and and there's so many of these writers you know she's one example I mean it's a, you know one I'm particularly fond of but and I, I think it is important to think about you know all of these things um, in, in, in sort of just a, an overview of what happens in culture mm -hmm. and and 
you know, why, I mean, I don't think there's any particular, I mean, every writer wants to write well, everyone wants, every writer wants to make every sentence count. Um, but I do think that, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying there's an answer, I'm not trying to give an answer to this, but I think it's a question, it's something that, that should remain a question mm -hmm. of why certain writers are on one side of this fence versus the other, mm -hmm. you know. All right, well, I think we can um, open up to audience questions now. Um, if you have a question, please step up to one of these two microphones to ask it so that everyone can hear you. I was going to ask you to go ahead and answer that question that you said is unanswerable. I mean, or just maybe explore that a little bit more, this notion of how, um, I mean, because you're wanting to write well, but you're also um, writing for an industry. And so when you're wanting to, to be read, how, how do you as writers approach this notion of um, emulating these writers that you respect, but also um, appealing to your publishers? Well, I mean, I try to do what Jeff does and try to go back into that, you know, I tricked myself into going back in, into that rabbit hole where I read, when, I read my, when I wrote my first book, um, which, you know, as I said, I wrote not even knowing that it was going to be a book. So I was so deep in a sort of state of mystification and perhaps denial, I don't know what, but it really was a very, you know, incredibly private exercise. And, you know, I finished my my first collection, I had a draft of it. Um, I think maybe two people knew that I'd written these stories and I'd worked on them for seven years. So that's a very private thing to do. Um, and, and I think that what I do try to do is just, tr you know, even though it's not reality anymore and, you know, I'll go to a dinner party and people will say, oh, when's your next book coming out? You know, so you can't go back there. People know you and then they, you know, they read your work and that's wonderful, but then you, 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 things change. But in order to write, in order to get up and sit at the desk, I do try to go back to now, what, 20 years ago, um, and try to, try to remember that, that isolation that, I, that is required because, um, I mean, it's the only way that I can write. I don't think I could write if I stopped to think about an expectation placed upon me. I don't know. How. Feel. Yeah, every nine years, there's about two months when I get to go to a dinner party, and it's and it's night. I mean, when's your next book coming out? Two months. The, the other eight years, I don't want to go to a dinner party. <laughs> First, it's a pleasure meeting all of you. I'm a teacher at an all boys Catholic high school. I definitely have a lot of good stories, um, but my question is. A lot of my students, I have on the curriculum the namesake, um, interpreter of maladies. They love it. They respond to it. How can we make these boys teenage writers writers? Are there any exercises, writing exercises, that you could suggest that can make them the teenage writers writer? <laughs> I uh, yeah, your question. <laughs> I mean, I know a lot of you, you know, read for inspiration, but any writing exercises or techniques? I mean, I, I, I think my answer is still that, you know, I mean, at that age, particularly, the, the main thing is that they're reading. You know, I mean, they can certainly, you know, they could keep a journal and they can write sentences on a daily basis, and that's a good practice and discipline, you know, sitting down and articulating some things going on in your mind or whatever, imagined or real, it doesn't really matter. Um, but, but I do think that, you know, I mean, when I was in high school, I wasn't doing any writing at all. I mean, I, was, I used to write for my school newspaper. Um, I would write English papers. Um, but I was reading, you know, I mean, I remember reading The Scarlet Letter. I remember reading Moby Dick. I remember reading The Great Gatsby. I remember reading Macbeth. I mean, I remember reading these things as, for, as a high school student for the first time and thinking, you know, this is the most incredible, uh, one of the most incredible things a human being can do um, is to, you know, to write on, on this level. And um, 
And so I think that's, I mean, that, that period of one's life, I think, when one is still a child but maturing rapidly um, is, a, is a particularly potent time to, to begin reading. And, and of course, I've returned to all of those books over time and, and gotten more out of them, um, different things out of them. Um, but I, I can't really say there's a, an exercise, you know. Like I think you become a writer in late adolescence and early adulthood. I mean, a reader, sorry. Um, and there's so much emphasis on getting kids to read. And everyone is getting, you know, children's books and making sure that, and then they just, they ease up in the teenage years. And, they, and that's when they, they go astray, and, and boys especially nowadays, stop, stop reading. And if they don't read at that time and, and become addicted to it, by the time they're 20, 21, maybe 23 at the latest, they're not going to have it as a, life, a lifelong habit. So they don't need any exercises for writing, but they need somehow to, to keep reading through those years until it just becomes self-perpetuating. And if you can make sure they're sort of miserable and kind of an outcast, that's probably the <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> You have yeah. to have no friends. You have to be a meaner teacher, number one. You're obviously too nice. Thank you. Yeah. I wondered about asking it the other way. Um, are there any writers that you guys look at now who are selling in big numbers, mm -hmm. like yourselves, who are writers, writers? Writers that you still love reading, that you're learning from, as you said, time is valuable. You don't want to be reading a huge amount of chick lit, is my guess. But I wonder are there writers that are, that, or that surprise you because they sell as well as they do, but they're doing something remarkable. I don't. I, I don't have the as I, the definition of writer's writer as a non-seller. I mean, it was interesting to talk about Susan Sontag because um, she should be on this panel because she she would go to a country and she would find the most obscure writer in that country and <laughs> give that writer a blurb Im immediately, and then it, it would almost seem as though she had read all the other writers in Romania and she had just chosen this, this one. Um, but I can think of is David Foster Wallace is a Writer's writer. George Saunders is a writer's writer. Both, both well, you know, read a lot. Um, is Philip Roth not a writer's writer? I may, I don't know, but you know, it seems to me that that he is. Half of the books are about writers, um, <laughs> so I, I think there are a lot of them, um, and I don't think it's hard to, to to find. I don't think you have to choose. Um, you're not you're not choosing obscurity um, because you want to be a writer's writer. It, there are these other terrible things that happen by fate and they're not fair and those are the things that jump us to crying and they're not easy to control um, why someone doesn't get enough attention. Sometimes it has to do with even subject matter. Um, but it, it's not always because of the, you know, the level of the writing itself. <laughs> I, I grew up watching uh, Bernard Pivot on, on TV5, you know, TV prime time, 8 o'clock, you know, at night, everybody's watching TV, you know, it's, uh, so I was wondering if there would be less writer's writer if, you know, like there were panels like this being shown on TV on prime time. If we were French, everything would be better, we understand that. <laughs> <laughs> it's just not going to happen in New York. Um, I'm not sure I have a good answer to that. I don't think that they really show writers on TV in too many places anymore, not even in France. I think um, we still have this idea that they do, but it's less and less and less and less. And I, I mean, I don't know that seeing a writer, you all will be able to vouch for this tonight, is um, <laughs> necessarily that illuminating. Um, <laughs> and in fact, uh, when I was becoming a writer, my, I had a uh, habitual experience that every time I'd meet a writer that I admired, I was disappointed. And they somehow seemed to me less the person they were in person than they were in the page. And I think that has something to do with a distinction between the author and the writer. Like the author is the person who has read everything in the canon and then some and all of the writers, writers, and the writers, 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 and so on and so forth. 
and who knows everything and who has this sort of kind of moral standing in the universe. And the writer is like, you know, a schlubby guy or, you know, just uh, morally imperfect like the rest of us and uh, with a big ego that comes trailing wherever he goes and et cetera, et cetera. Or, you know, has terrible table manners like Susan Sontag or whatever. And, um, I mean, there's sort of endless things that sort of change your vision of that person. And some, somehow it's at a certain point that sometimes it's better just to preserve the sense of the writer on the page because that is the, the best possible version of ourselves will always be. So I don't know necessarily that, that seeing the living, breathing thing will do much. I think we're all going to go back to the same thing, which is just... Um, to read, to, you know, to put books in the way of people, and young people, any people would be nice, um, and to, to make it possible to have the accident of happening onto the book that's absolutely the right book for you at that moment as if it were written for you. I mean, that's, in a way, that's like the thing that makes the writer, finding that book that feels like it absolutely speaks to you and your conditions as if the writer could see through your skin and had written that book for you. And then suddenly you think, wow, I'd like to do this. Um, how is this done? Or at least I'd like to read something else like this that makes me feel like this. I've gone looking for that feeling everywhere and so on and so forth. I'm wondering about the role of the story. You know, I understand the importance of the expression and being so moved by one sentence and not leaving that sentence and having to read it again and remembering it always. But surely you have to have something to say, not just say it beautifully. You know, it seems as if a story, even if it's an obscure story, even if it's dense and you can't, it takes a while to get to, don't you start off with wanting to tell a story? Well, <laughs> I don't think any of the writers I admire are you know, I mean, if they have density, it's a, it's a, it's a density that enhances the story. I mean, but there's a, I mean, with, in Gina Berrio's case, I mean, she, there's an incredible lucidity that you don't get in most, I think, in most uh, writers' prose. Um, so yes, I mean, she's a master on the sentence level, but there's also a, 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 a simplicity, a lucidity that is, that is moving the story forward. So that there's no sort of unreadability you know, dimension, I would, I, I don't think. I mean, I'm not sure if that's what you're asking, but. No, I don't mean to imply that. It's, the discussion has been so much on how you tell, how you write something and the beauty of the language. But the, the word story, you know, having something to actually say through a story, you know, that it doesn't necessarily have to have a beginning or an end, but all of you have written books that tell a beautiful story as well as conveying great emotion and being beautifully expressed. But the concept of story hasn't been mentioned and so I'm wondering about its role and how you write. Well, your point is, is absolutely valid. It, the story is a very important. It's because of the topic we're forced into talking just about, <laughs> about the, you know, the fineness of the style. But I think all of us um, you know, care, about, uh, care about narrative. Um, and I think all of the yeah. writers we're talking about care yeah, all the ones that I, I pick I mean, do, yeah. Because that's that's an essential component of yeah. being a writer is telling. I mean, that's the heart of it. So you know, sometimes Bello can just go on about anything, and I will read it, <laughs> yeah. even if there's not, a story doesn't happen for a hundred pages, but it's somehow still entertaining. I don't know how he, how he does that. I think also it's probably a misconception to imagine that for all writers the story comes first. Um, I think for some writers it probably does and for some stories by some writers it does and others not. But at least for me, um, of course the story is important. Of course I want to tell a good story, but it isn't where it begins for me ever. Um, and the story happens, um, it evolves in a kind of accidental way. And it really can begin from something as simple as 
a voice um, without knowing at all where that voice fits or what story it's going to tell or um, the juxtaposition of two very remote things, two voices or two places um, or uh, two um, strange ideas and out of beginning to explore that juxtaposition characters emerge and then who are those characters and then suddenly we're telling a story but um, it isn't always the thing one leads with. I wanted to ask, um, several of you have had your um, books adapted into movies, and I wanted to ask about um, if, uh, if you could speak about that process a little bit and how much involvement you had with it and what it was like to have a screenwriter actually take your story and use different words and yeah, if you could just speak about that a little bit, that would be interesting. That's you. Um, that's right. Um, I saw S Stephen Sondheim um, talk on Monday, and um, he said they asked him what film of his plays did he like the best, and he likes Sweeney Todd the best. And um, in explaining why, he said, because Tim Burton changed it the most in the ways that it needed to be changed. Those weren't his words, but that's basically what he said. There, there's a famous song from Sweeney Todd. I can't remember the name, um, but everyone thinks it's crucial to the to the play. It's one of the most popular. And they tried. They they, they wrote the song. They filmed it, and they. At a certain point, Tim Burton realized that the film didn't need this song. You needed it on stage, but you didn't need it in the film because of the way film is different. And so they cut it out. And, and far from being upset by this, Sondheim, being very good drama, you know, dramatist, realized that film tells a story differently. And you have to change things. You have to be ready to to cut things out and to sacrifice things that worked in the book. So my only, my only feeling if a, if a movie is made or uh, of one of my books is that it works as, as a film. Obviously, I want it to be inspired by my book. I want it still to tell the same story and, and not to um, completely be different than, you know, and I've had two experiences, one where, where the director told the story of my book and didn't change the plot, and one where a short story of mine constituted the first 20 to 30 minutes of a film, and then the, the next hour was, was added on material. Um, and that was, uh, you know, you could understand the, the filmmakers doing that because it was only a short story. Um, they didn't do that with Brokeback Mountain, though, I noticed. <laughs> but um, it did happen to me. Um, but what, what I would want is, is the director could change lots of things if it worked as a film, because that, that's what you want it to be. It's a different art form. It's, it's radically changed once it becomes visual. It's no longer a, a book, and to try to insist on it being a book usually will make it a, a poorer film. I agree. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I, I appreciated the the fact that it was very different. Yeah. You know, I was sort of, I feel very indifferent to my work when I'm finished with it. So yeah. in order for me to be able to re-engage with it as a film, I'd like it to be as different as possible in some right. fundamental <laughs> ways, you know, just so that I can yeah. be interested in it again because I'm so sick of it at that yeah. point. <laughs> in that case, I really should have liked the switch then. I really, it's as different as could be. <laughs> these, these will be the last two questions. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Hi, um, sorry, um, this, my question is for Juba. Um, I'm yeah. <laughs> we would joke at my work that I might get a restraining order after coming here. Um, so I've, re I've read your books about each of them about 20 times, and um, The Custom Earth was probably one of my favorites. And I just wanted to know what, out of all of your stories, because they're all so different and conflicting in different ways, what, like, what did you feel the most connection to? And what was the most, like, what resonated the most with you? You're asking which of my stories I've connected to? Well, especially because, well, for me, like, what the unaccustomed birth, the last three, like, the intertwining mm -hmm. really meant. 
Well, I mean, as I said, you know, and I really do feel this strongly, I mean, I, when I finish working on something, it, 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 it dies. I'm, it, it's dead to me. <laughs> and I need that to happen. Because when I'm working on something, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm giving it life. And we all are. That's what a writer does. And you're living and breathing and experiencing intensely the life of these characters and the life of the story or the life of the, the language is, you know, playing in your head and whatever. It's a very intense experience um, to write something. At least it is for me. And, but when I'm through with it, um, it is a sort of, I, I, I bid it adieu and I, 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 it is, I, I no longer have a connection to it um, creatively or and in any other way, and I feel that it is then finished, and it's either going to be, you know, it's either going to be published maybe, or maybe it's going to be put in into a file or a folder or a drawer, or whatever I decide to do with it. Um, and that's how I feel. I feel a sort of cold indifference toward all of my work, <laughs> except for what I'm working on right now. And so the book I'm working on right now is what is consuming everything I have. Uh, and I don't have anything to give to the work I've done in the past. The only thing I appreciate about the work I've done in the past is that it has taught me how to write the next book and positioned me to write the next book and pushed me forward to try to not make the same mistakes I've made in the previous books and to just deepen myself as a, as a writer. And that's the only purpose to me that the previous work formed. So, you know, I'm. In terms of my three books, I mean, I can say, okay, well, this one was doing this, and this one was maybe doing that, and this one was doing, was doing the other thing, but, I mean, they're like, they're like children, so in that sense, you can't distinguish enough, but on the other hand, they're sort of like deceased children. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, children who have moved away. You know, <laughs> um, so the answer is, there's none. There's no story. I have no attachment to any of my former work. <laughs> But that's, I have attachment to other people's work. You know, I have attachment to other people's mm -hmm. books, other writers. Yeah. Those are the Other books people's that, dead children, you yeah. <laughs> I take them in. Well, at least then, I have an attachment. <laughs> Thank you. To yours. And if Thank I write you. a book, the, those children will be dead to me. <laughs> Hi. Um, you know, you've all, th first of all, thank you. Um, your insights have been really, um, Really wonderful. But um, my question is, you've all insisted, I think, um, correctly that, you know, critical acclaim and the quality of one's writing um, don't necessarily have to be completely, you know, opposite to one another. That great writing can also be critically acclaimed and have large readership. Um, my question is, on the flip side, why do you think that so much poor or ugly writing is so popular? <laughs> It's yours. <laughs> yours. I'm going on um, too much. I don't know. If I knew the answer to that, um, everything would be a lot better for me, I'm sure. But I, I think, you know, work that is writing that demands something of us, which is all of the best writing, um, is annoying to a lot of people. Um, and. I can accept that. We all sort of have to accept that. Um, but I think le a lot of books um, sort of fall into the category probably of entertainment. Um, and we we, we're a culture of entertainment. We love entertainment. Everything, we want almost everything to be entertaining. Um, and so I think, I suppose, um, a lot of books should be that, um, to feed that desire. And I think that's OK. Um, but I suppose the, the books that we've all been talking about, we're coming out with endless definitions now of the writer's writer, and the writer's writer is um, not very entertaining ever. Um, or maybe only a little if they're bellow, I guess, then they're very entertaining. But um, most writer's writers um, are incredibly demanding um, of their readers. They really make us work. Um, but of course, um, the rewards for that can last a lifetime. All right, thank you guys so much, and thank you all for coming. Thank you.